This, my friends, is steak. Recently, I played around with just about every way you can cook one particular kind of steak, but that just made me want to take a closer look at all the different kinds of steak that are out there in this wacky world of ours. There are so many factors that distinguish one steak from another, from the breed of cow it comes from, to the way that animal was raised and processed, to the part of the animal it comes from, all of which are going to have an impact on the dish that ends up on your table. With all those variables at play, you could go a lifetime without eating the same steak twice. Today, we're going to take a look at 12 very special steaks steaks that highlight the most important elements that give a steak its unique character and flavor. Armed with that knowledge, you'll have a better understanding of what you're looking for in a steak and why. I'm Emil Stonic, and this is 12 Types of Steak. Let's start with some basics, shall we? We use the term steak to refer to a cut of beef that is tender enough that it can be cooked relatively quickly and to temperature, as in rare, medium rare, medium, rather than being slow cooked to a soft, shreddy texture. The primary thing that separates one cut of steak from another is where it comes from on a cow's body. At the end of the day, all meat is muscle, and the way individual muscles on a cow get used is going to have a profound effect on the way that it cooks. As a general rule, Muscles that get a lot of use are going to be tougher and leaner, whereas ones that don't get used as much tend to be richer and more tender. Today, we're going to look at 12 different cuts of beef, but that's only one aspect that makes each steak distinct. We're also going to be considering the breed of cow they come from, the diet they were raised on, their age at the time of slaughter, and finally, how their meat was processed. Let's start with breed. There are over 70 different breeds of cattle that are raised for beef around the world each with their own unique characteristics and history that impact the type of meat they produce. The most popular breed in the U.S. is Angus. The Angus breed was originally developed in Aberdeen, Scotland, but in the 1870s they found their way to the United States. American farmers were impressed by how quickly these cows gained weight and how much meat they could get off of a single cow. For our Angus steak, we decided to go with an iconically American cut, the T-bone steak. This bad boy is cross-cut from the forward section of the cow's short loin and gets its name from the T-shaped bone that runs along the top and through the center of the steak. The T-bone is actually a two-for-one cut. The bigger side is a New York strip steak, and the smaller side is a piece of the tenderloin. Those white streaks that you see in there are made of fat, specifically intramuscular fat known as marbling. The bits of fat between those muscle fibers are what makes a steak rich and juicy when it cooks, and both this steak and the breed of cow it comes from are known for their marbling. This this particular steak is real thick, which means it's going to take some time to cook, and has a handsome fat cap on the outside, which is going to lend each slice some added richness. Let's see how this cooks up. Look at that beauty! Mm, I love the smell of steak in the morning. This fat cap is looking especially appealing to me right now. It's going to lend every slice off of this steak a little bit of extra richness. One of the things that makes a T-bone steak challenging to cook is that bone that bisects it, which conducts heat at a different rate than the meat does, and you actually have to stand it up on this flat side for a period of time in order for it to cook properly. To carve this, we're going to take off the New York strip side first, look at that color, and then the tenderloin section and slice them up real nice. Let's taste the tenderloin portion first. Mm. This is a muscle that doesn't do that much work at all, so it's very tender, like melt in your mouth, but relatively mild. Mm. But this New York strip side is beefy. It's got a little more chew, but big flavor, and the fat just coats your mouth in deliciousness. To me, this steak is as American as apple pie, a real straight down the middle crowd pleaser. The next breed we're looking at is the Hereford. This breed also originated in the UK, specifically from the county of Herefordshire in England. These cows are rugged, tough, and adaptable. And like the Angus, they produce a lot of meat. For this breed, we decided on a Newport steak, which is basically just a tidy little slice taken from a larger cut called the tri-tip, a large, triangular-shaped steak that comes from the bottom sirloin. The Newport steak is sometimes also known as an apartment steak, probably because it's so manageable and affordable. As you can see, it has a lot less marbling than our T-bone did. There's still fat in there, but it's concentrated in larger veins and on this edge. This cut comes from a muscle group that controls the cow's knees, so it's going to have more pronounced flavor and probably a bit more chew. A couple of minutes in a hot grill pan should be all it needs. And let's put the cloche down. Voila! That right there is a tasty looking steak for one. Because we cooked it in a grill pan relatively quickly, we've got some nice looking grill marks but not a ton of overall caramelization. But I'm excited about this tender looking ribbon of fat on this side. Cutting in, it looks gorgeous. Looking more closely at this slice, you can see those larger veins of visible fat surrounded by leaner meat, which is going to have an effect on the eating experience. Mm. 
it's definitely on the leaner, toothier side. But the more you chew, the fat releases and the richer it becomes. Mm. The flavor is outstanding though. Layers of full, minerally, beefy flavor. I wanna eat this with a cold beer in front of the TV. Piedmontese. This very special breed originates from the Piedmont region of northwestern Italy. This is the Schwarzenegger of cattle breeds. They're known for a genetic mutation called double muscling, which means that their bodies don't restrict muscle growth, so they end up looking like they're on steroids. They take longer to grow, but they get bigger than other cows and are definitely on the leaner side. For this monster of a cow, we've got a monster of a cut, a three inch thick porterhouse. The color of this meat is definitely deeper than our Angus steak, and there's way less marbling going on. You may notice that this steak looks remarkably similar to the T-bone we saw earlier, and that's because it's almost the same steak. You've got strip on one side and tenderloin on the other, except it's cut from the rear end of the short loin, and as such has a bigger chunk of tenderloin attached. This is gonna take a while to cook. Let's get it under the cloche. Okay, since this steak is so huge, we actually cooked it in two stages. The first in a low oven, so it could get up to a juicy medium rare throughout, and then we grilled it right at the end to caramelize the exterior, a process known as a reverse sear. It's a really effective way to get a giant steak like this under control. Wow, look at that unbelievable wall of pink. This meat looks muscly, noticeably leaner than our other breeds. Interestingly, the same genetic mutation that causes double muscling also makes the meat exceptionally tender, even if it's less rich. Let's give it a taste. Mm. Wow, 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 wow. That flavor is insane. Way, way beefier than our other steaks so far. Mm. This tastes really burly without being overly gamey, and it's complemented really nicely by the smoke from the grill. There's definitely less fat going on, but a drizzle of good grassy olive oil would fix all of that. This is a really special steak. Next up, we have Brahmin. This unique breed originated in India and is a descendant of the Zebu, an Asian breed of cattle. They're known for their large humps and their ability to tolerate extremely hot environments. A camel, but make it cow. This steak comes to us from the fine folks at Brahmin Country Beef in Texas, who specialize in this very special breed. This time around, we're working with an outside skirt steak, which is a long, flat muscle that is attached to the outer part of the chest wall. The color of this meat is really wild. Deep, dark red, almost purpley, and it also has a lot less visible fat than you'd see on a skirt from another cattle breed. When you look more closely, you can see the loose grain structure that this cut is known for, and also that it's been mechanically tenderized at the processing plant. They've run it through a device that scored it, which interrupted those muscle fibers somewhat. I'm really curious about what this one's gonna taste like. Ooh, you know, I could use a drink right about now. Thank you, Magic Cloche. Ah, there's our steak. And there we have our cooked outside skirt. So obviously this is just a piece of the full steak. We need a really long grill to cook the whole thing. Skirt steak is thin, so it just needs a couple of minutes on each side on a smoking hot grill to get us to the medium, medium rare we're after. When you're serving this one, it's really important to slice it as thinly as possible against the grain, which is gonna further disrupt those muscle fibers and make it as tender as possible. You're always gonna have some more well done bits on this steak. Let's give it a taste. Mm. Wow, I've actually never tasted anything like this before. It has a very strong flavor, pretty gamey, minerally, almost venison-like, with a kind of toasty, popcorn-y aftertaste. It's definitely on the drier side, but the eating experience is still really exciting because it's got flavor for days. Wagyu. So Wagyu literally translates to Japanese cattle. Over the years, certain Japanese cattle breeds have been selectively bred and raised to promote incredibly high levels of intramuscular fat and tenderness. The result is unlike any other beef in the world. In Japan, some farmers feed their cattle beer and give them massages and things like that, but that's not as common of a practice as restaurants would have you believe. Regardless, it's crazy rich with a price tag to match. This time around, we went with a culotte steak, which is just a sexier name for the top sirloin cap. This is a thing of beauty. The color is just so deep and red, and the marbling is really striking. It's definitely not as intense as it would be on a higher grade of Wagyu or an inherently fattier cut of the animal, but it's still freaking gorgeous. And I'm super excited about that big juicy fat cap. All right, let's get the cloche on it and beautiful. So here we have our cooked Wagyu culotte. We barely cooked this guy. 
poking it, I can tell that it's still practically raw inside. Black and blue, as they say. That's what you want with Wagyu. You don't want to render too much of that fat out, and the fat in Wagyu beef actually has a lower melting point than that of other breeds, so it literally melts in your mouth. This slice is so amazing looking. It's glossy from all that marbling, and that piece of fat cap is the cherry on top. Mmm, wow. That is so, so special. Honestly, it's like eating butter. The texture is like a firm piece of sashimi. It's super savory, a delicate, almost mushroomy flavor. Mm. My mouth is just totally coated right now. It's so rich. I don't think I can eat more than two or three pieces of this, but damn, is it good. Let's check out some bison. So, bison are indigenous to North America and were one of the meat staples of Native Americans before they were nearly hunted to extinction by European colonizers. The cattle breeds we discussed so far are really different from each other, but bison is actually a completely different species altogether. They have a lower fat content than cattle and are richer in iron and protein. Since bison tends to be tougher than beef, we decided on the filet mignon, a cut from the tenderloin. This highfalutin steak is prized by some for its tenderness and mild flavor, which is exactly the reason why some steak lovers turn their noses up at it. There's very little marbling to speak of, and you can see that this one has been tied to make it more compact and help it cook more evenly. Let's see how this one cooks. And presto. So we gave this filet a quick sear on both sides. You do not want to overcook this cut because it's really easy to dry out. Can't forget to cut that string. You can see how it helped to keep the steak in this tidy cylindrical shape. Cutting in, we're looking at a nice, even medium going on in here. These slices are extremely even and uniform, and it actually feels soft to the touch, like it would be easy to pull apart with my hands. Mm. You know, I'm not usually a fan of filet, because I feel like it's lacking in the flavor department, but bison is so much stronger tasting than regular beef, and this filet has a lot going on. It's kind of grassy, it has a minerally, irony, almost livery flavor to it. It's tender, and a little bit on the mealy side, but this is definitely a filet I can get behind. So, breed is one really important variable, but a steak's character is also profoundly affected by what kind of feed a cow is raised on. Which brings us to our next type, grass-fed. For most of history, all cows were 100% grass-fed. Cattle are still primarily grass-fed in South America and Australia, but here in the US, only about 3% of cattle are classified as 100% grass-fed. This time around, we went with a cut from the flank that goes by a few different names. In Argentina, where it's really popular, it's called Vasio, and in France, it's better known as Bavette. This dramatic burgundy color is characteristic of grass-fed beef, and it's also pretty lean, which is to be expected from beef that's just been chomping on lawn for its whole life. Generally speaking, grass-fed beef tends to have a bit more chew and gamier flavor than the grain-finished stuff, which is either an asset or a liability, depending on who you ask. Let's bring our magic cloche back in. Now you see it raw, now you see it cooked. Now that it's cooked, you can really see that pronounced grain structure that I associate with a cut like this. It's almost ropey looking. Just like our skirt steak, it's super important to slice this guy thinly and against the grain to maximize tenderness. Ooh, that inside looks really moist. It's perfectly cooked. And that slice is really, really pretty. Taking care not to overcook grass-fed beef is one of the ways to ensure that it's as juicy as possible. I can't wait to taste this one. Mm. Yum. I love the flavor of grass-fed beef. It sounds kind of stupid, but it really does taste, you know, kind of grassy. It's got a lot of flavor, and I can see how that might turn some people off, but that rich, earthy flavor really does it for me. Yum. Now that we've seen grass-fed, let's take a look at grain-finished. Around the middle of the 20th century, U.S. farmers realized that when they fed corn to cattle, they grew way faster than they did if they ate grass alone. The faster the cow grew, the cheaper it was for farmers to raise them, and the high protein and starch content of grains led to better marbling. Now, the majority of cattle in the U.S. are fed grass early in their life, but finished on grain to bulk them up before slaughter. This time around, we're looking at a Denver steak, which comes from a relatively little-used muscle situated underneath the shoulder blade bone. It's got really nice marbling, and it's a great example of the way that fat develops in a grain-finished animal. The color is you know, slightly paler than that of our grass-fed steak, but it's still really pretty. Let's hide this for a second, and 
Oh, you know, I am feeling a little bit heartburny right now. Ah, that feels better. Oh, good, the steak's back. I was worried we'd lost him. Ooh, I'm obsessed with the color we got on the exterior of this steak. The shape of this cut made sustained contact with a hot pan really easy. And that inside is exactly what you want, just wall-to-wall -wall pink. These slices look really nice. They're kind of glossed up from those little bits of rendered intramuscular fat. Mm. Mm. This is nice and rich. It's juicy, totally delicious. The flavor is slightly less complex than the grass-fed, which you can chalk up to the fact that it's a younger animal that took on fat more quickly. It's still really lovely, and definitely what most Americans expect when they're eating beef. Another factor that has a huge impact on the taste and texture of a steak, how old a cow is at the time of slaughter, which brings us to our next type, veal. Veal is beef that comes from a calf rather than a cow that's reached maturity. Here we have a classic bone-in rib chop, which, if it came from a more mature animal, would be called a ribeye steak. What we're looking at here is rose veal, and it's decidedly different from factory veal or white veal, which comes from animals that have usually been raised in confinement. By contrast, rose veal comes from a calf that's been milk-fed by its mother and then grass-fed on pasture until it's around six months old. The meat is pink rather than white because the calf has had some time to actually develop some muscle. This almost looks like a pork chop. The meat is soft to the touch but not flabby, and it's got nice structure. We've got some nice fat here on the cap and in between these muscles, there's not a whole lot of marbling going on. It's really pretty. I'm excited to try this one cooked. Ah, there's our veal chop. So we seared this quickly in a hot pan and then finished it with a smidge of good butter to get a little gloss on there. Veal is a lot leaner than regular beef, so it can use the extra fat. Cutting in, oh, that interior is such a different color at medium rare than it would be for mature beef. It's actually really similar to the color it had when it was raw. Let's try it. Mmm. Wow. Really tender. You know, the most notable thing going on flavor-wise is how mild it is. The meat is almost creamy tasting, with none of the irony, minerally character that I associate with meat from a more mature animal. I could see myself eating this once in a blue moon, but personally, I'm missing that full, beefy flavor, which we're going to get plenty of with our next type. Mature cow. So the longer a cow lives, the more work its muscles do and therefore the less tender the meat becomes. But what you lose in tenderness, you make up for in rich, complex flavor. In the early part of the 20th century, the average beef cow was slaughtered at four to five years. Now, it's more like 12 to 15 months, due in large part to how much faster the animals can grow when they're finished on grain. But this steak right here is from a nine-year-old Angus steer, a New York strip steak to be exact, which comes to us from Kinderhook Farm in upstate New York. Right off the bat, you can tell how different the color of this steak is from our others, but especially from our veal. The meat has this deep, ruddy color, and the fat is more yellowish, and it's really firm. The marbling is pretty impressive, but I can see that there are some gristly bits there that we didn't see in the steaks from our younger animals. And even though meat from older cows tends to be tougher, the New York Strip is a fairly tender cut, so I'm looking forward to seeing how this turns out. And beef. Wow, the smell is fairly strong. And I can tell that we lost some fat in the pan because of the way that it shrunk up. It actually feels pretty tender to the touch. The meat is really pretty. And the fat has an almost beeswaxy quality to it. Let me give this one a taste. Mmm. Wow. The steak has huge flavor. It's really, really earthy. And the longer I chew, the more layers of flavor I'm getting, it tastes like a porcini mushroom almost. Big umami energy. It's definitely tougher by a mile. I'm not sure that I could eat an entire steak like this to the face, but this is something that I hope that everyone gets to try at least once. All beef is aged to some degree, which allows natural enzymatic processes time to tenderize the muscle tissue and create a whole array of savory new flavors. A lot of meat is wet aged. Wet aging sounds kind of fancy, but basically it's just storing the steak in a vacuum sealed bag. Since the steak is sealed in its own juices, it doesn't lose water weight the way that it does when it's dry aged. 
making the process less expensive for butchers and consumers, but also makes for less dramatic results. The cut we're working with here is a flat iron, which is a tender little steak that hides in the chuck, a primal cut that people often don't bother to dry age. This is another nice little dinner for one steak, manageable size, decent marbling, and it's pretty quick cooking. You know, even though we dried it off really well with paper towels, it still feels kind of damp and flabby, to be honest. Let's go to the cloche. We gave our flat iron a quick sear on a really hot grill, which is really all it needed. There's really nice browning here. Cutting in, it's nice looking, plenty moist, and that grain structure is tight without being tense, you know? Mm. I love the flavor of this cut. It's complex without being too gamey, and it's plenty tender. It does taste a smidge watered down, but not in a really noticeable way. And there's a faint tinniness that I tend to associate with wet-aged meat. You know, I'm not mad at it though. Now, for contrast, we're gonna take a look at a steak that's been dry-aged. A dry-aged steak is a piece of beef that's been cut from a larger primal cut of the animal that's been hung in a cold, humidity-controlled environment for anywhere between seven and 120 days. Over time, the meat will lose water weight, concentrating its flavor. And dry aging also promotes the activity of friendly enzymes and molds that tenderize the muscles and build flavor. The dried out exterior of the meat usually has to be trimmed and discarded, further contributing to lost weight, which is part of the reason these steaks command a higher price tag. So this time, we chose a bone-in ribeye. This particular steak has been aged for over 60 days. Prime fatty cuts like this one are ideal for dry aging. And this is definitely one of my all time favorite cuts of beef. The marbling is really impressive throughout, and these thick veins of fat are gonna keep things nice and juicy when it cooks. You can tell that this beauty has been dry aged just by touching it. It feels dense, not flabby, and it has an almost tacky exterior. I cannot wait to taste this one. Let's get it under the cloche, and beautiful. Oof, that is a sight to behold. We pan seared this bruiser and then finished it in the oven, and the exterior is incredible looking. Dry aged meat takes on a sear way faster than wet aged because it's already lost so much water. Uh, this is definitely on the rarer side of medium rare, but that's just how I like this cut. Ooh, I cannot wait to gnaw on that bone later. This meat looks amazing. These slices are just shining with fatty goodness. Mm. Mm. Damn, that's good. The flavor is just so much denser than the wet aged steak. And the fat has an almost nutty flavor that I associate with cured meats like prosciutto or something like that. Mm. The cut, the dry aging, I'm in heaven. This is a slam dunk. And there you have it, folks. 12 distinctly different and delicious steaks that showed us just how many variables contribute to the unique taste and texture of the meat on your plate. I think I need to go get my cholesterol checked now. Have a favorite kind of steak you didn't see today? Leave it in the comments.